afternoon. I'm so glad that you're here. When, when Ricky comes up with the, the camera right there, it's a really cool shot, but it always makes me wonder if my pants are zipped. Hey, if it's your very first time, I want to welcome you here. We, we start out with music around here because it's our very favorite way, one of our favorite ways, my favorite way, to celebrate our faith and to worship God. So I want you to make yourselves at home, sing with us. We're going to sing a few more, and then Pastor Brad's going to come talk to us. We'll have you out of here in just about an hour, okay? Now, come on, put your hands together. There you go. Cut, cut.
Jesus, we turn our hearts to you this, this afternoon. Just as we are, we come. We present ourselves just as we are today, Father. Meet us here.
waters lifted up. service today is God in the house amen you know what just as we are God loves you Jesus I come just as I am I don't have to make those changes I don't have to be perfect for you today because you love me you love me my brokenness you love me you love me sit down and just let that sink with you God loves you welcome to North Rock Church my name is Danielle we are so excited that you've taken some time this Sunday to spend it with us. We recognize for some of you, it is your very first time. We consider you our VIPs. That's right. We love seeing the new faces that come through those doors. Now on the back of your seats is a connection card. If you wouldn't mind just taking that out, taking a few moments to fill it out, we would really appreciate it. It lets us learn a little bit more about you and helps us learn what we can maybe serve you better, how we could pray for you. You can put those in the offering bucket as they come by at the end of the service or go right back outside to our VIP tent. We've got friendly faces who would love to answer any questions you might have. All right, last weekend was Easter. And let me tell you, God brought the house down. We had five amazing services. We had so many stories of life change and we had one that was up here and her name was Jaden. God took the brokenness in her life, the things that she was afraid to lay at his feet and you know what? He's healing her. She is alive in him. And you know how that happened? She got connected. She got connected to a local church. We would love for you to connect right here at North Rock so your story can be one that God changes, God refines, so you can make the difference in the life of someone else. Guess what? How do you do that? You do that through Growth Track. Growth Track is happening today following this service. We do it the first and third Sunday, so you can be here today. This is where you're gonna learn our story. This is where you can become a member and where you can connect to a serve team. We'll have a warm meal for you. We're gonna take care of your kids. So make plans to be here. Let God use you ways you never even imagined. This is also the first week of April. So on the first week, we have First Wednesday Prayer. If you haven't been, it's an incredible, unique experience. Unplugged worship, it's our acoustic worship, but we get to come together corporately pray for our families, our church. We get to pray over the city of San Antonio. So whatever burdens or heaviness you may be bringing, or even if it's joy in something you're celebrating, be here Wednesday night. Join us that evening. You won't regret it. Seven o'clock, and we do have child care for children. 
under age five. All right, before Pastor Brad gets up here and starts our new sermon series, you're going to love it. Waking up in Vegas, go ahead and take a look at the screen. Hello, noon service. You guys awake? You better be. You got to sleep in today. Great to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, today we are starting a new service, uh, or sorry, a new series, Waking Up in Vegas, and I'm excited about it. Before we get started, though, why don't you just say hello to somebody around you real quick? Maybe you don't know them. Maybe you do know them, but just get to know somebody real quick. It's all right. It's a good sound. All right, you guys aren't as chatty as the last service. However, if you are single here today and I just made your day, uh, you can uh, just give me that monthly eHarmony fee, uh, and I will take that. My name is Brad. If I haven't said that already, I'm one of the pastors here, and, and it is an honor to speak to you guys today. Um, how many of you have ever been to Vegas before? Raise your hand if you've been to Vegas. I see some party animals in here. Your face is kind of lit up when you're like, yeah, I've been to Vegas. All right, um, so Vegas is a crazy place. I've been there uh, five, or, five or six times and always for work, and um, it's probably by design, but when you fly into Vegas, it seems like you always fly in late, right? I, I never get an early flight. You always fly in late, and when you get there, you go right to the hotel, and it's just craziness. You go in, people are cheering, people are screaming, people are cha-chinging, I mean, they're making money. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And uh, if you ever go, though, for work, typically you have to get up early. Now, it's a totally different scene in the morning, right? When you get down there at 6 a.m., it goes from being a cool place to a pretty pathetic place because you got people at 6 a.m. trying to win all that money they lost the night before. And there's just regret on the faces of people everywhere. People calling their wives, letting them know, hey, we just lost our life savings. We may even have, give, have to give one of our kids away. I lost it all today, hon. But um, Vegas is, is kind of set up for a place of regret. If you think about it, it's called Sin City. All right, so there's your first hint. Um, there's marriage chapels everywhere, 24-hour marriage chapels. And, you know, you might go to Vegas. You might meet that special one at the casino table. And you just know, like as you're losing your last $100, you just know she's the one. And you want to make mom proud. So you head on down to the 24-hour marriage chapel and, and get it done. There's also casinos inside of casinos. There's so many casinos. When you get off the airplane in the airport, there's slot machines where you can literally start gambling before you even get your luggage. So it's set up for that. There's also prostitution everywhere. I learned right away when I was walking the first time down the road, they're passing these cards out. I'm like, oh, trader cards. No, those are not trader cards. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. There's also drugs everywhere. I'd, I've never had anyone offer me drugs, uh, I don't think, in my life, except in Las Vegas, maybe in Miami one time. But I was walking down the sidewalk, and some guy walks up and is, like, whispering. And I'm like, what? He's like, you want some X? It's like, some X? He's like, I, I don't know. And my friend's like, no, you don't want X. I'm like, I'm like God, I think I'm good. Why are we whispering exactly? Anyway, I didn't know what X was. I, it's weird, but in my head, I was like, X, maybe like an X-ray? Like X, they're offering X-ray service? I could not figure it out for the life of me. But anyway, drugs is what he was saying, in case you didn't know. And I didn't want any drugs, but it is a place where people are set up to make a lot of bad decisions. However, Vegas is not the only place we have to wake up and have regret. Unfortunately, it can happen right here in our home. It can happen at our workplace. It can happen just about anywhere. We have regrets, we make mistakes, and we have some miserable times because of the decisions we make. Um, just like these guys I'm about to show you, though, I want today, I want you to leave here making it a permanent declaration that you are done with regret. I want you to regret knowing, okay? It's time for you to regret knowing. It's time for you to have no regrets and no regrets, all right? As I told the second service, these are oxymorons or maybe just morons. There you go. What is regret? It's defined as this, to feel sad or sorry about something you did 
or did not do, to feel sad or sorry about something you did or did not do. Let me show you something I regret. I regret finding an app on my phone called FaceSwap. Have you guys ever seen that app? So this app is designed where you and another adult look into this camera and it swaps your faces. Now it's not designed <laughs> for you to use on your child. That is my wife and child, folks. I haven't slept for weeks after seeing this. I mean, I love my little boy, and I love my wife, but in this picture, I'm just like, ugh, I regret this. If anyone's ever told you you look just like your mom or just like your dad, you need to slap them, because if you look just like them, then it's going to look something like that, and that's creepy. I wanted you all to have to have some nightmares along with me. Get it off. Get it off the screen right now. Thank you. I've made some mistakes in my life that have led to regret, some small and some big, and Unlike sometimes when I'm, I'm, I'm preparing a message, I have to think through some life stories of my own that I could personalize it, and it's hard to find things. But for this one, I sat down, and it was just like tons of memories come to mind, all kinds of regrets and mistakes that I've made. And uh, one of them I was thinking about is one of those cringe moments. You ever had like something you said or did, and even now, you think back on it 15, 20 years ago, and you're just like, oh, why did I do that? Well, I was working at a fitness center and they wanted us to become more personable with our customers, so they encouraged us to learn their names, learn a little bit about them, um, anything we could. And so one day I decided, all right, I'm going to really, uh, here's my chance. And a lady came in that I knew, and I was kind of getting to know her a little bit. She'd been a few times, and I was like, oh, here's my big, my big window of opportunity. So I stepped up, and I'm like, it's so good to see you today. Hey, I didn't get to ask you the other day, but how far along are you? Now, keep in mind, I'm 20 years old, all right? This didn't happen yesterday. I've, I've learned a few things since then. I want, my wife was six months pregnant, and I wouldn't even ask her how far along she was because I'm, I'm terrified. That moment haunted me because she kept coming back, right? It, she comes to the fitness center. It's not one of those you see them and they're a stranger and never again. She kept coming back every day, and I would have to find it, you know, like run to the bathroom again or something. And, oh, my gosh, it was a terrible moment. Another one that I wanted to share real quick. This is one that's kind of stayed with me for years that my friend's from high school still give me a hard time about. Um, I was somewhat of a class clown, not, not crazy, but you know, I like to be funny and do stupid stuff, and I uh, like to have attention. Let's just be honest. I liked attention, okay? And I was, uh, I, I was on the track team because my girlfriend was. Why else would I run in circles? Why else would you ever run when there's cars and bicycles even? Even a skateboard would work. Um, but I, I was on the track team. We would drive up to the University of Arkansas and use their indoor really nice track facility. And so this day, we're up there. Some of the University of Arkansas track team is in the building, so it's a big deal. And uh, they had a, the hurdles set up. And I decided, now's a great moment for me to impress everyone in the building. So hurdles, you can raise them to different levels. And you can raise them, like, really high. Like, I don't know why they go that high, but I raised it to this crazy, crazy, ridiculous height. And I decided, all right, guys, I'm going to get going because I was pretty fast. So I'm going to run really fast, and I'm going to jump over this, and I'm going to impress everyone. Because, you know, jumping a hurdle impresses everyone. So I take off in a dead sprint. Yes. I take off in a dead sprint, and my front foot cleared it. My back foot didn't have the, great, the, the same luck. Now, the problem was that the hurdle was facing the wrong way. Okay, they have little legs on them so that they'll easily fall over. But if you run the other way... They, they won't fall over, no matter how hard you trip over it. So I go into a mid-air flip, and I come down on this surface that's called rubber that is a kryptonite to your skin, and I go into a full-on slide across this in my little track shorts that are so short, girls can't wear them to school, but I can wear them to run in because everybody wants to see that. And, and I come to a stop, guys, and I am bleeding everywhere. I look like I just came out of a motorcycle accident. My legs are just torn to pieces, my wrist, my nose. Okay, I've kind of got a big nose, so that's easy to believe. And then my, my forehead, and I'm just bleeding, just rubbed my skin off. And I look up, and there, coming and crossing paths with me when this all came to a stop is Coach John McDonald. Here's what you need to know about him. He was the current University of Arkansas track coach. He also is the most winningest coach in all collegiate sports in the history. 
He also has won 40 national championships, more than any coach by far. And he's standing there looking at me, kind of like I'm looking in these lights. You know, angels just, oh, and I'm looking up at him, and I, I feel like I was reaching. And, and he looked at me, and I'm waiting for this big, inspiring moment, like, son, life's going to trip you up at times, but you just got to get back up. So I'm like, here it comes, here it comes. And he looks at me, and he just says, that's going to hurt. <laughs> and in my mind, he, like, stepped over me and then, like, kicked me a little bit and walked on by. But it was a terrible moment. So for the next two weeks, I've got like scabs on my nose and forehead that are a constant reminder of what a dumb, dumb decision I'd made. My girlfriend stayed with me, so that's good. I don't know why, though. But we have those moments. And this one's a little bit of a bigger deal, but this is a heavier thing. We have the heavy things we look back in life on. For me, in my early 20s, around the age of 20, I walked away from God and from the church ultimately. I had grown up in church. My parents raised me in church. I loved church. I loved ministry. I knew that God was calling me to that. When I was in like kindergarten or first grade or something, they ask you what you want to be when you grow up. And I wrote a pastor. So I knew at an early age that that's what I wanted to do. God was calling me. And I got into my 20s and maybe I got a little burnout. Maybe I got a little hurt. I don't know. No real excuse. But I just stepped away from the church and it ended up being for years. And that was a painful time because I made some bad decisions. I got around some wrong people. I got in some bad relationships. I just did some really dumb things that over the course of those few years, I look back, and that is my moment. So all of you, you probably have a moment, maybe multiple moments, but my moment was several years, actually, of looking back thinking, why did I do that? Thinking back and wishing I could have made it different. And I want to share more of that in a minute. But here's what I've learned during that time and, and, and now is regret robs you of your future and it holds you hostage to the past. It robs you of your future and it holds you hostage to the past. The truth is we all make mistakes in our, in our past that we wish we could do over. Some of us, we regret what we've done and others, we regret what we didn't do. But we all have regret because we've all made mistakes, but God doesn't want us to, li to live sealed to that regret. Romans 8, 28. This is a scripture, if you, if you don't know this scripture, if you don't have it highlighted in your Bible, if you don't have it written down somewhere, it's a great, great scripture to have. And it says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things, all things good, all things good. It's really good to know that God takes our past mistakes that were meant to destroy us by the enemy, and he loves to take those times of our life and those decisions and those mistakes and that regret, and he loves to turn that around for good. Only God can do it. Like, I'm terrible at doing it. I can't go back and make my past mistakes turn, it just, I just become a fool. But God can do it, and he loves to do that, because he loves to remind the enemy that he's still God and he's still in control. He loves to remind the enemy that no matter what he brings at his people, God can take that bad stuff and he can turn it for good. So I don't know what you've done and where you've come from, and I don't know how heavy your mistakes may be, but I want you to know God can turn them into good. I know some people that are still living in, in the past and living in regret, that are being robbed of their future and being held hostage to their past. The same people that have been living the same lives. There's no real joy. There's no real ambition. There's no future. They're just existing. And all that time, God is just waiting. God is just nudging. God is just saying, when will you just come back to me? When will you stop living that life in the past? It's okay. There's a better life. When we live in a state of regret, it causes us to make these statements like this. If only I had done this. If only I hadn't done that. And then it starts to make us think, if we would have made some different decisions, what might our life look like? If I had just done this 20 years ago, five years ago, two days ago, what might my life look like today? And that's what ends up holding us hostage to the past, because we can't get our mind off of the past in order for God to use us in our future. Regret doesn't have to be a place we live any longer, and for some of you, I, I kid you not, and I heard some incredible stories of of some people that had prayer after service, I want you to know, some of you today need to hear this, and I want you to know that some of you today, you're going to learn that you don't have to live a life of regret anymore. You don't have to live hostage to the past 
anymore. And I want to share a few things with you to help you with that. I'm reminded of a guy named Peter in the Bible who experienced regret really greater than any of us. Peter was a guy that Jesus found. He was a fisherman. He followed Jesus, became a disciple. They had a really great relationship. They were very close, very good friends. And they lived life side by side, doing ministry together, Jesus teaching him and showing him just like he does us, just walking with him and teaching him day after day. Later on, Jesus is going to be uh, facing the cross soon, and he knows that he's going to die, and he has this last supper. Maybe you've read about it in, in the Gospels before, but he's, he knows that his time has run out. He knows it's coming, so he has all his disciples together, and they're sitting around talking, and of course, Jesus is probably feeling the weight of what's coming. The disciples are sitting around, and, and they're discussing who's the greatest of the disciples, who's the greatest in the kingdom, and Jesus kind of finally puts him at a stop, and, and, and he tells Peter this. He says, Peter, I want you to understand that before you hear the rooster crow twice, you're going to have denied me three times. Peter gets a little defensive, maybe, and, and says, that can't be true, Jesus, because you have to understand, I would go to prison for you, and I would even die for you, Jesus. I would even die for you. Well, Jesus does end up getting arrested, Peter ends up kind of following them, trying to figure out what's going on, what are they doing with Jesus. And while, he, while this is all happening, he gets noticed by several different people who say, hey, weren't you with Jesus? And he's like, no, 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 no. I, fear begins to come over him. He's terrified of the unknown. Jesus isn't by his side in his mind, so he's scared. So then a second time, he says no. A third time, he says no. Finally, he curses and says, I don't know this man. Leave me alone. Suddenly, we read in Mark 14, 72, right after this happened, immediately the rooster crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Imagine how he must have felt in that moment as soon as he's reminded that Jesus called him on this. Imagine how he must have felt rem reminded that he even told Jesus, Jesus, I would die for you. I would go to prison for you. Yet just when he gets questioned, do you know Jesus? He says, no, I don't, I don't even know the guy. Then Jesus is crucified. Imagine how he must have felt at that point. Then they bury him. Imagine the turmoil he must have felt and the regret of, of denying that he even knew his best friend. Not just his best friend, his savior. And then for the next three days, Jesus is in a grave and, and he must have felt terrible. He must have felt awful thinking, I denied him. Now, Jesus didn't stay dead. As Pastor Jonathan shared last week, he came alive and it changes everything. And sometime later, Jesus is going to be ascending into heaven. And one of the last conversations he has is with Peter. And I pick it up in John 21, verse 7. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I'm jumping to verse 17. So three times, this is the third time, he says to Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, so you know I love you. And Jesus has a... a a strange response. He says, okay, if you love me, after asking him three times, he says, feed my sheep. Now, when I first heard that, I remember thinking, was this like a guilting thing? Like, kids, do you love me? Kids, do you love me? You do? Okay, feed the dogs and clean your room while you're at it. It wasn't that, though. What Jesus is saying is, Peter, you remember the work I started in you? When I found you and you were fishing for fish and I started teaching you how to fish for men, do you remember that? Well, I want you to know, I still want you to continue that. I want you to know that the plan I had for your life before you made this mistake and denied me, I still have that for you today. And ultimately, Peter, I want you to know I loved you before you denied me. I loved you when you denied me. And today, guess what? I still love you the same amount. I wanted you to be a disciple and teach people about me before you denied me. 
I wanted you to be a disciple and teach people about me when you were denying me, and today I still have that same plan for your life. Jesus knows he's about to ascend into heaven, and he's basically telling Peter, we don't have any time for you to stay miserable living in the past because we have a way, way bigger future for you to get a hold of. I believe Jesus is saying the same thing to you today. In fact, I know he is. In fact, I know Jesus is saying to everyone in the room, including me, we can't keep dwelling on the past or we're never going to get the future that God has promised for you. It's time to step out of that. It's time to let those chains be broken and to move in and step into all God has for your life. I love 2 Corinthians 7.10. It says this, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Today, I want us just to own up to our past. I want us to own up to those mistakes, those things that may be driving you nuts, those if I would have, what ifs, all those different things that you can think to get us back in the past. Let's just own up to them for a moment. And let's allow God to change our mindset for just the next 10 minutes. Are you on board with that? All right, great. Four ways to get you out of Vegas. Four ways to get you out of Vegas. To stop living in the past, to stop waking up thinking what if and, and hating the regret that you have and the misery. Four ways. Number one is this, really receive God's forgiveness. This is the most important one. If you're, if you're taking notes, write this down. Really receive God's forgiveness. Here's what I mean by that. My wife and I have been married for a few years, and uh, we got engaged uh, in New York City on top of 30 Rock, and it was an incredible day, an amazing planned out thing on my part. Um, and I did an incredible job, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> Not really, I mean it was cool. But uh, I got on my knee, I got this ring out, I presented it to her, and she responded with yes, yes, yes. And we hugged, and we cried, and we laughed. Then she laughed and I cried, I don't know, it was just lots of crying on my part, I don't know why. But it was just an awesome moment. And we started immediately moving to the future. Like, we honestly, that was the last day we were in New York. We were with a group of people. We were there. We went from there to the airport. The whole airplane, airplane ride home, all we were talking about was our wedding, who's going to be in it, what's our honeymoon going to be like, all this stuff. We were planning the future. And that's a lot like God in forgiveness. When he comes to you, or when you come to him, rather, and say, will you forgive me? His response is not, maybe. I mean, my wife did not take the ring and say, are you sure you want to give this to me? My wife didn't say, well, let me hang on to it for a few days, and, and you let me know if, if you still want to do this in a couple of days. Absolutely not. It was an exciting, awesome moment. That's how it is when we go to him in forgiveness. He doesn't hold it from you. He doesn't keep it from you. He doesn't say, well, if you'll go get your life right, then maybe. He says, just as you are right now, I forgive you. Now let's move to the future. Let's start making plans right now. What are we going to do tomorrow? Here, let me tell you something I've been wanting to tell you for weeks. If you would just have received my forgiveness, we could have started talking about this, but we're here now, so let's do it. We have to receive his forgiveness. Stop asking him to forgive you for the same things you've been asking for 10, 15, 20 years. His answer was yes then. His answer is yes today. When we say yes, we're saying the cross matters. When we say no or when we have to ask over and over, it's us saying the cross wasn't big enough for my sin. But let me tell you, it was, and it is. So whatever you're dealing with, give it to him today and be done with it. Sometimes we struggle to receive forgiveness because we struggle to forgive others. Sometimes we struggle to receive his forgiveness because others haven't forgiven us. And we've lived in that life and in that culture, and it's hard for us. But his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And today, he says yes to you. Really receive his forgiveness. Micah 7.18 says, Where is the God who can compare with you? Wiping the slate clean of guilt, turning a blind eye, a deaf ear, to the past sins of your purged and precious people. It's Christ's pleasure to say yes to you today. Number two is this, eliminate the if-only thoughts. Eliminate the if-only thoughts. Has anybody ever seen the movie Napoleon Dynamite? Those that laughed absolutely have seen it. If you haven't, do yourself a favor and go see it. There's a guy in that movie named Uncle Rico. You guys know Uncle Rico? There he is. What a good-looking guy. 
I love that shirt. Uncle Rico, he's like a 40, 45-year-old man in this movie, and all he can do is talk about back in 82. If I could just go back to 82, we'd have won state. Back in 82, I could throw a football a quarter mile. He's just always living in the old life. If only I could go back. If only I could go back. Some of us are living life in 82. You get together with some friends, and all they want to talk about is, you remember that one time? And you're like, yeah, but that's over, man. We, we can't do that again. I have several friends of mine that we were all good buddies, and we were all uh, single in most of our 20s. And when we get together, it's easy for us to reminisce, but we don't stay there. We're never like, man, we ought to all get divorced and go back and get an apartment together. <laughs> you know, we don't do that. We don't do that. We have to get out of that men- mindset. You can't go back to 82. I remember a story I heard a few years ago about uh, a group of coworkers who all went in together and got a lottery ticket. And they won. And they won a lot of money. A lot of money. And I was thinking about the story we don't hear. What about the coworkers who they came up and like, hey, John, man, you want to jump in on this lottery ticket? And John's like, nah, man, I'm, I'm good today. Or someone else that was maybe on their phone and they didn't even quite hear them and they just kind of, nah, nah, you know, just getting them away. And then what must have it had been like to come into work that day after they won and none of them came to work because they're on their private islands, <laughs> right? How awful must have that have been for those that are sitting there in those empty chairs or reminders of the regret? If I could just go back, I would have said yes. It must have been a horrible thing. Now, I don't know if it was a lottery ticket for you. For me, it was in my 20s, like I said. If I could just go back, and that's something that drove me nuts for a long time. But we have to finally eliminate those thoughts. We have to finally understand God's plan for our life it is not us going back and fixing something. His plan is always for the future. His plan is always for the now. But we're not going to go back and change or fix anything. I love Colossians 3, 2. It says this, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Here's what I've learned. Most of our if-only thoughts are about, if I could go back and do this, then I would have this. I would have the perfect marriage. I would have that truck or that perfect career or all that money. A lot of the things we want to go back and change, are it's stuff. But guess what? You can't take any of that stuff with you. The only thing you can take with you when you leave this world is you can ultimately take your family and you can take your friends. That's all you can take with you. So set your minds on things above and not on the earthly things. The third thing is turn your regret into motivation. Turn your regret into motivation. I, uh, like I said, in my 20s, I made some... I made some mistakes, to put it lightly. I just, um, I just walked away from God, and I have a lot of reasons why I did that, but they're not good reasons. But I knew at an early age I wanted a family. I knew at an early age I wanted to have kids. My brother and sister are older than me, and when I was a teenager, they had little kids, and I loved it, man. I just knew I was going to be a great dad. People always tell me, like, man, you're going to be a great dad one day. So I knew, you know, like, hey, I wanted to be, I had my life planned out. I'm going to be married by 21, I'm going to have kids by 22, have another kid by 23, have another, 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 have 14 kids, it's going to be great. I'm going to pastor a church or be in ministry. I had all these plans. And I watched over the years my peers who were at the same level of me, the guys I went to camp with, the guys I grew up doing ministry with, I watched how their lives, because they didn't step away from the church, I see how their lives, they, they got to have all the things I wanted. They got the family. They had the kids. They had, some were pastoring. Some were, were leading big ministries and doing big things. And so for many years into my 20s, and even, even as recently as a few years ago, I was really, really struggling with that. I was really struggling. If I could go back and change this, but at some point, I had to turn my regret into motivation. At some point, I had to just say, the past is the past, and dwelling on it is not doing anything but bringing me down. I've got to get past it, and I have to move on. Times I would become so frustrated, though, and wondering, what if? And I finally had to turn my if only into what if, 
as far as what my future was going to be like. And I still have moments where I look back on it, still have moments where I look back in the rearview mirror, but it's just for a moment. I look back to my past to see where I've come from. And you remember how earlier I said God loves to take the mistakes and the regret of our life and turn it into good? He loves to take that stuff we've done and allow you to be a story and a witness for someone who's going through the same thing. There's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than being able to tell someone, man, I've been where you are. And here's what I want to tell you. God would love to do that in your life. And because I got sick of being regretful about my life and sick of just living in the past, I finally got my mind made up. I finally got rid of some of my commitment issues, even though all guys, I think, have commitment issues. But I had some problems with that. And then my wife and I got married. And now, maybe it wasn't when I was 21, but now I get to go home to this every day. And it is the most amazing thing ever. Isn't that amazing? Don't you just want to give him a little kiss? Well, you stay away. That's weird. Just kidding. I love my family, and God has blessed me in a big way. The last thing as we close is let God and then fill in the blank. I want you to fill in the blank. I don't want you to leave here just looking at this piece of paper. Just for the next few moments, I want you, if, if you didn't get notes, you can write it on your phone. But I want to challenge you all to write something down here. What do you need to let God do in your life? What do you need to let God to do? I can't fill in the blank for you. I can give you some suggestions, but you have to make it personal. Only you know the area you need to let God, and all of us have an area where we need it. But see, the enemy would love for you to leave that blank so that tomorrow is just another Monday of misery, possibly. Tomorrow is just another day where you wake up thinking, if only I had made this choice. But I want to hold you accountable right here and, and tell you to write something down here. What do you need to let God do in your life? Maybe you need to let God forgive you once and for all for that mistake you made, for that baggage, for that series of choices you made. Maybe, maybe you need to let God into your life completely for once. Maybe you're a control freak and it's hard for you to let God have control of your life. Maybe you need to let him just completely save you today. What is it for you? What's cool about God is he loves to fix our mess. And he loves to fix our messes. So today I want to encourage you to make your regret available to God. And if I can just help you in some way step out of over here in the past, step out of those old regrets and start stepping into the future with God. He designed you on purpose, with a purpose. Whether you're 15 years old or 85 years old in the room, he still has purpose for your life. Regardless of how many years you walked away from him, it was 50 years or 20 years or five years, just like with Peter, he's saying to you, feed my sheep, man. Get back on track. Know that I've loved you through it all. Know that when you stepped away from me, I was stepping towards you. Know that when you were turning your back on me, I was still standing there with arms wide open saying, I still love you. Excuse me. When I think of what the Lord has done in my life, there's nothing I, I can convey to help you understand how much I want you to feel that same relief of knowing that your past is truly that. It's the past. I want to encourage you so much today to let God take your hand, pull you out of that where you've been held hostage and to pull you into that future that's been robbed of you for so many years. And today is your day. Let me pray with you. Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful congregation of people. Thank you, God, that you forgive us completely. That even though we've maybe struggled to live in the past and, and the regrets that we have, that today is our day 
to step out of that. That that same calling and purpose that maybe some in the room felt years ago that you still have for us today. That even though the regret and misery just kind of grows up inside of us when we think about some of the embarrassing choices we've made that maybe have affected us in, in a terrible way or even those around us. That even through that, today again, your answer is yes. That all along you've been just waving us and cheering us on to just come back to you. God, and I thank you that I believe today can be that day for some of these amazing people. As we continue to pray with every eye closed, I'm going to take a moment just to say, if today you would like to be your day where you just give it all to him, where you just completely give him control, maybe you're saying yes to Jesus for the very first time, or maybe you've been struggling so much and it's been so long you can't remember the last time you truly gave your life over to him. If today is your day, I want to pray for you. And I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand in the air. No one's looking around but me. I'm not going to ask you to come down. I just want to know who I'm praying for. If that's you, would you lift your hand right now where I can see it? Lift them high. Lift them high. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Hands all over the room. Anybody else want to join these? I want to, I want to pray for you. Today is your day. It's an amazing, monumental day in your life. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Pray this prayer with me. Lord, thank you so much for this moment. God, what an honor and a privilege it is for me to pray for those that have list, lifted their hand and said yes to you today. God, because everything that we do here at North Rock, every hour, every moment, every week that we spend is for this moment, for people to know you. God, thank you that years ago when I walked away from you, and when I came back, Lord, you led me back on this path to where I am in this very moment, helping people say yes to you. And God, I pray for those hands that were raised, that they would know that you're going to do the same thing in their lives, in their world, in their own special way, God. That by saying yes to you, we're stepping on and into a journey with you that is unlike anything we could ever experience. So we confess today that you are the Lord of our life. That you are the Lord of everything we do. And we give you complete control. And we're going to leave here like we've never left here before. We're going to leave in a brand new way, completely cleansed of our sins and giving you com complete control of our lives. And I thank you, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Would you guys give a big hand to those that lifted their hand? Thank you so much for listening with me today. Would you give it up for Pastor Brad? Give it up for Pastor Brad. Fabulous, man. What an incredible kickoff to our new series, and uh, I'm very excited about this series. We will be continuing this throughout the month of April, so for the next three weeks, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, listen, if you were one of those who raised your hand a moment ago and, and, and you surrendered your life to Christ, we would love for you to take one of these uh, Connect cards that are in, in the seat back in front of you as well as in your worship guides that were handed to you. And at the very top of the back, <clears throat> it says, I committed my life to Christ today. We would love for you to check that top option on the back and then uh, fill out the other side. And you can do one of two things with this card. Uh, you can either drop it in the offering when it comes by in a moment or when we close our service, uh, you can take it to the back of the room where our prayer team is uh, under the big exit sign, and you can put this card in their hands. We want to do a couple of things. <clears throat> Nobody's going to come to your house or anything like that, but I want to send you a book uh, that we want to share with you that just kind of talks about your fresh start and where to from here. Um, also, we'll send you an email and uh, that will talk about all the opportunities that North Rock has for you during this season of transition, this, this faith journey that you have uh, that you have begun. We want to come alongside you. We don't want you to be in this decision by yourself. This is a huge moment for you. And so we want to help you understand everything that's happening and help you see the options that we have for you here at North Rock to help you um, during this season. All right. Also, right now, we're going to prepare to give our, our Sunday tithing and offering, giving back to the Lord financially. 
This is one of the most practical ways that we worship and we live out our faith. I mean, we trust the Lord with our heart, with our life, so we can absolutely trust Him with our finances. And uh, in, in, as part of our, our faith journey and part of our obedience to Him, we give. And we have many ways for you to give financially here at North Rock. A giving kiosk in the foyer, um, online at our website, um, right here in, in the auditorium, in the buckets. You can also give here in the auditorium uh, via text giving or anywhere via text giving. And uh, however it is that you choose to give, thank you because you're making a huge, huge difference in the lives of so many people. Just last weekend, during our Easter, our five Easter services, uh, folks, we had over 2,000, in fact, 2,068 people worshipped the Lord here at North Rock last weekend. Could we give just some thanks for that? Yeah, <laughs> pretty grateful for what God's doing. And that's, that's almost 2,100 people that were able to hear uh, the message of the resurrection and how that changes everything for them, able to hear how easy it is to believe in God and just make Him the Lord and the Savior of your life, surrendering your life to Him. And as, as a matter of fact, what's even worth celebrating more than that um, is, is the fact that 37 people gave their life to Christ for the very first time last weekend. 37. And that's worth celebrating. That's 37 people that are on their way to heaven, and we love that. Amen. Connected to Jesus for all of eternity. So uh, what a great opportunity we have to, to support this incredible, these incredible things that are happening. And so every time you give, you're helping fuel what God is doing here um, in San Antonio through North Rock Church. So as our ushers come and we give, let me tell you about a couple of things. <laughs> Number one, next Sunday. Everybody say next Sunday. Next Sunday is April 10th, but um, it, it's more than that. Uh, next Sunday is our next baptism experience, and uh, we love baptisms here at North Rock. That's one of the most exciting things that we do that we get to be a part of. And if you've never gone public with your faith in Jesus through water baptism, this is your opportunity. We would love to baptize you. Uh, we are, um, we are, we get excited about baptisms. We'll be baptizing after all three services, and uh, it's going to be an incredible weekend. You don't have to sign up in advance. You can just show up the day of, and there'll be a big blue tent out there, and you can sign up right then and there uh, for baptisms and be baptized then. Water baptism is your next step if you've put your faith in Christ. Every time a new believer in the New Testament put their faith in Jesus, they were always baptized. They were always baptized. It's, it's one of the analogies that we like to give is that it's the wedding ring of Christianity. All right? It symbolizes that I belong to Jesus and he belongs to me. Another analogy that we love to use is um, in Galatians, the Bible says, Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, that when you're baptized into Christ, you, you, you clothe yourself in Christ. You clothe yourself in Christ. So we always talk about how we love our, 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 our cowboys or our spurs. So we wear our spurs jersey. We want everybody to know this is our team. But when you're baptized, Paul literally says you clothe yourself in Christ. So that's, that's your team. I want everybody to know that I'm on his team. And because of that, I'm, I'm not going to lose, y'all. I'm not going to lose. So baptism is all about identification, and we're very excited about next weekend. And I encourage you, if you've not been baptized, to make plans to be baptized next weekend. Additionally, if you need prayer for any reason at all, our prayer team would love to pray with you. They're available under the exit sign back there. When we close, you can just ease back there. Don't leave the building without getting prayer if you need prayer. All right, would you stand? All across the room, I hope that you're as excited about church today as I was. Growth track, growth track starts in about three minutes right down here. So if you're not going to be here at growth track, I will see you back next weekend for week two of Waking Up in Vegas. God bless.
All right. All right, we're ready to sign you in if you're here for growth track right over here. If you'll grab yourself a drink and then have a seat in this section right here. drink and then they're going to be bringing the food out to you. Everybody have a pin. 